and uh, I uh, am looking forward very much to maybe uh, giving you some uh, insights into uh, what it was like, first of all, to go to the moon. And uh, we need to take that, wait a minute, let's take that down. Otherwise I won't be able to see it. This is a uh, this is a 15-minute video that was put together more or less on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the landing of Apollo 17 on the moon, and it's going through now with the help of uh, some friends in Canada. Uh, and you'll see their names here in a moment. And Teresa was a great help as an editor and inspiration. Uh, but it was uh, primarily focused on the Apollo 17 flight. The, uh, and I like to think of myself as the 12th man to step on the moon if Neil Armstrong was first. Uh, Robert Godwin was a great help in this uh, effort. And uh, a, another gentleman, Mark Gray, did an earlier version of this. The, uh, this is just the beginning of work uh, that you see two astronauts performing and sampling a volcanic ash. But to get to that point uh, on any of the Apollo missions, there was a great deal of field training, uh, four or five days a month in the last three missions, and actually beginning with Apollo uh, 13, uh, the mission that did not land. Uh, we used all the gear uh, that we had, uh, got used to that, Dr. Radio Communications, and we were working on sites that uh, represented some aspect of the geology we expected. We also had other types of training. Here you see survival training in Panama, uh, in the Shankas River, uh, a few, uh, three astronauts moving down the river, hopefully uh, to survive that little experience. But ultimately, it was the morning of December uh, 7th, Florida time, uh, and actually it was uh, more like the afternoon for us, and uh, Al Shepard is uh, wishing me well, I presume. I couldn't hear a word he said, of course, you know. Uh, Cernan going to the elevator, Ron Evans, and I seem to have forgotten where the elevator was. Uh, somebody said I was saying hello to a young lady. I don't, I don't know that. And then I tried to get away with it, but uh, Charlie Buckley would not let me out. So. Uh, in the white room, so-called white room, uh, uh, Gunter Vent and his crew uh, made sure that we were all tucked away in that spacecraft and then uh, we were off. The noise of that launch uh, uh, probably equal to those who were listening, the vibrations we were feeling in the cabin, uh, the first stage, very heavy vibrations. Some of you may have unfortunately driven a truck down uh, a railroad track across the ties and you'd get some idea of what that was like. Uh, once in orbit, uh, we checked everything out and then uh, accelerated from about 18,000 miles an hour to 25,000 miles an hour uh, on our way to the moon. Uh, Ron Evans docked the two vehicles uh, together so that we could take the Lunar Module Challenger with us uh, to the moon and, uh, and a three and a half day flight. Uh, working in the weightlessness for the first time is a very interesting experience, like being in water without any water. Uh, and you just gotta take it easy. Uh, one of the things that my father passed on to me was an in interest in meteorology, and so I spent most of that three and a half days observing the weather patterns of a rotating Earth beneath me, trying to make forecasts and see what the, how they worked out the next day. Uh, but the Earth, of course, was shrinking, uh, uh, apparently shrinking as we moved away from it. Here's Australia again as a beacon in the south. Ultimately, we were in orbit around the moon, looking at actually looking at our landing site in the Valley of Taurus Littrow. This is a valley deeper than the Grand Canyon. 
Uh, the Colorado, the mountains on either side, uh, six and 7,000 feet high. The lunar module Challenger, there you see going uh, uh, after uh, docking uh, and actually um, moving towards the surface now. And if you look carefully up there in the upper left, is the shadow of the uh, lunar module uh, as it uh, approaches the, uh, uh, yeah, you can turn all those lights out if you want, including the ones up here. The, uh, uh, we finally got a little bit of dust, not much for this valley. We were expecting a great deal because there were some, the speculation was they were actually covered with volcanic ash of a fairly young age. We'll get more about that in a few moments. Uh, looking out after landing, uh, you see uh, the uh, uh, scene that we had before we got outside and disturbed it. Now, one of the first tasks we had was deploying an Apollo scientific package. Uh, part of that was drilling a deep uh, core, about three meters deep. And Cernan asked me to come over and help him get it out of the ground. He got it in, but it was very tough to get uh, out of the ground. And here you see uh, some help that he probably didn't want later. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we finally got the core out, and it's one of the more valuable uh, pieces of scientific data that we have. Now, at another station, this was on the second excursion, uh, second of three, uh, I had uh, dropped the sample container you see there, the bags, the samples had come out, and I finally recovered. And, uh, and getting up, though, was not uh, too, too much uh, uh, of a task, but hanging on that stupid bag really was. Uh, <laughs> more than I could handle. <laughs> In my defense, I was on a little bit of a slope here, but that's not much of a defense. At this point, uh, Bob Parker, who was the uh, uh, Capcom for us, said that uh, his uh, screen is, had lit up with phone calls from the Houston Ballet Society. And so I decided that I needed an audition, and uh, that didn't work out too well either, as you will see. <laughs> and then the, the old camera lens went into the regolith. Uh, some of these, uh, these footages are, are uh, mosaics of television. Cameras. This one or not, it, uh, just a uh, mosaic of a set of pictures that Gene Cernan took while I was working over at the Orange Saw. You're starting to see some of the orange color there in the walls of the Crater Northern Shorty. We'll talk some more about that when I get to some slides. Uh, Shorty is about an 80 meter diameter impact crater, but it uh, had exposed and deformed uh, a deposits of ash, black and orange ash. Uh, we call it orange soil in the uh, in transcript. Uh, but uh, not knowing at the time that it was volcanic ash. Little tiny beads of glass, spherical beads of glass for the most part, about 40 microns in average diameter. Uh, and this also illustrates here how it's better to work as a pair on the moon, one person doing the sampling, the, uh, bagging the sample, uh, and the other uh, actually collecting the sample. That scoop uh, was a very, very good geological tool for me. Uh, we also had a geological hammer but I found that the scoop worked uh, very well with this. Now that, that's a, not very much exaggerated for the color of that orange soil, particularly when it was in direct sunlight behind you. Uh, it acted a bit like a, a, a beaded reflector, but it, we found out uh, after we pulled a core out of it that beneath the orange soil was black ash. The black ash being partially devitrified, uh, orange ash, uh, and the, the different devitrification minerals were what made it uh, look black, but the, the chemical composition was identical. <laughs> now, over on the third EVA, we visited uh, uh, several boulders that had uh, rolled down the side of the what we call the North Massif. Uh, this is uh, uh, on that, and Cernan is uh, doing his bunny hop across the surface. And in his defense, now <laughs> having fallen, uh, is that is about a 20 degree slope on that surface. It doesn't look that way because of the position of the camera. Again, now here I, I mentioned some TV pictures that are put into a mosaic just to give you a feeling uh, for, uh, I think, the general terrain that we were dealing with. Uh, this is that big boulder. It's a boulder at Station 6, which some of you may be familiar with. And, uh, and, and here I'm standing in, in a crater taking a panorama, and now we're back to more or less live action. Uh, one of the few pictures of an actual face that you'll see 
uh, in the Apollo. I, being a good geologist, I raised my gold visor so I could see the rocks a little bit better. And, uh, and I wasn't looking directly into the sun, so I don't think I was taking any chances there. One thing, coming down the slope uh, at another station, I decided to practice some of my uh, ski <coughs> Caught an edge there, uh, and uh, but then it continued towards the rover. Cernan is still up on the side of the mountain, working on a big boulder that turned out to be a very uh, important uh, rock uh, that we found at that site. <coughs> Again, a, uh, a view of the whole valley from uh, up at that uh, position. I'm working down at the rover, and now we're going to zero in on the lunar module, which is probably about four kilometers away. Wow. Yeah, just that orange spot down there that you see. Wow. The uh, uh, activity uh, working on the surface uh, really was quite easy. Uh, you were encumbered by the suit. Uh, but uh, we got very used to it, and by the end of our time on the moon, uh, I was able to move very rapidly across the surface using, as I mentioned at the table, a cross-country skiing stride, a little bit of a toe push, and you're going through a boulder field uh, with, not, uh, with no concern whatsoever of my ability to maneuver uh, between the boulders. That rocking motion was uh, really a very useful and, and efficient way to move on the moon. For those of you who go to the moon, I strongly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, time we spent there uh, not only enabled us to, uh, uh, to understand a great deal about the geology of the valley, but it gave us a, a good feeling, I think, for what we might have to do when others return. Here, the rover's been parked away from the lunar module, it's lift off. I'm headed back from the outset uh, and back inside. A few, uh, a couple, we actually had a sleep period and then we left the moon. Now that's not a great picture, but it's, uh, it's the only one we could get off the TV screen. Cernan asked me to go outside and get a really good picture of lift off. <laughs> I was able to decline that. <laughs> now, looking down uh, from the uh, cabin, you see that, and now looking down at the same view of using the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Photography, you start to pick up our tracks. Uh, and if, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later for, with the same picture. Uh, the, uh, the Challenger upper stage, and now uh, ascent stage, is rendezvoused with uh, Ron Evans, who was in the uh, uh, Command and Service Launch of America. Ron had a, a task of going out in a, a spacewalk, as they call them. Uh, I like the term space swim, but uh, nevertheless, it, it never took on. The, uh, Ron uh, is going to retrieve some film canisters, uh, and of course, hi, Mom. That was his uh, wave there. And those canisters he would bring back to me. I was in the cabin to see my head there on the left, uh, and taking some pictures for Ron but also uh, to grab those film canisters and, and push them down back inside. Well, three days later, we were, we were back to, close to the Earth. We entered the atmosphere at about uh, 25,000 miles an hour again, splashed down in the South Pacific uh, near the island of Samoa, and uh, with the parachutes, of course, uh, uh, being recovered later. Those parachutes actually are in the museum uh, that, uh, in New York. It's quite uh, res uh, the rescue helicopters picked us up to take us over to the old Ticonderoga, a, a, a then uh, ASW carrier uh, that had uh, gotten the duty to rescue us, uh, or at least pick us up. I don't know that we needed rescue. So. <laughs> the uh, walking on that red carpet was tough. You see Ron uh, moving back and forth, and I was too. Uh, you just you lose some of your balance sensing uh, with uh, two weeks in, in space. Uh, and most of it in weightlessness. Cernan and I were probably in a little better shape than Ron because we had at least adapted to 1.6 gravity. <coughs> Captain Green, who also uh, 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 commanded the decommissioning of the Tycho, was there briefing us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to do some more, uh, more geology here in a few moments, but the Apollo program really was uh, uh, one of the greatest events uh, in human history, no question about that and uh, will remain so, I'm sure.
Yeah. We left a plaque on the moon. Uh, ours was a little different than others. Uh, it read pretty much like the plaque from uh, that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin left. Uh, but it, it had on it a image of the moon, at my request, that showed the six landing sites that we had on the surface. These are the commanders and the, and the lunar module pilots that landed on the moon. Twelve of us, and it was a great opportunity and great privilege to be uh, here. <laughs> and with that, uh, we'll go to I'm sure there's a computer nerd or two in the crowd. <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to go back, Bob? <laughs> uh, this is uh, before we get into the geology. Let's let's make sure everybody remembers uh, a little bit about Apollo. Its uh, origins, of course. Uh, began way, way before President Kennedy made his announcements. Uh, uh, it didn't bear it. Just a little less than 50 years since the Wright brothers had, had uh, uh, flown for the first time in a powered flight in, uh, uh, at Kitty Hawk. And then in 1961, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, <laughs> President Kennedy suggested that we go to the moon and return safely to the Earth. Uh, it was to counter the Russian and Soviet advances in human spaceflight. Uh, it was a major competition in the area within the Cold War. And, but uh, in Apollo 8, in orbit to the moon in December of 1968, uh, which for many of us was the mission that we never expected to fly, uh, was the, uh, one of the most exciting missions in spite of that the, uh, the space race really ended. Moon race ended with uh, Neil Armstrong's successful landing uh, on July 20th, 1969. Uh, there were five additional Apollo missions. Uh, they landed on the moon. Uh, that landed on the moon uh, between November 69 and, and December of 1972. And I like to mention here that when you think about what young men and women, mostly young men at the time, did, uh, there was a period between November 1968 and November 1969 when we launched a Saturn V rocket, which you'll see here in a moment, every two months for missions to the moon, basically. Remarkable set of achievements. Uh, Apollo 13, however, as you well know, because of the movie, uh, was damaged by an explosion and rescued, literally rescued, in April of 1970. The last three Apollo missions each explored different areas of the moon for full three days, uh, in contrast to the one to two half days that the other earlier missions were able to accomplish. Uh, 850 pounds of moon rocks and soil were brought back to Earth, still very actively researched. Uh, those, uh, we continue to look at those samples. I keep asking my colleagues that uh, are deeply involved in that how they pay for it, and they keep avoiding the, uh, the question, so I'll let you make up your own mind on how that's done. Uh, but a great deal of information. I'll be, uh, this month, I'll be at the 46th Lunar and Planetary Science Conference uh, in Houston. That, uh, and uh, uh, there is new information that fills a week worth of information. Now, of course, now it includes Mars and 
and Venus, but uh, the, the lunar sessions will be uh, active every day of that. Great new understanding of the Earth's early history has come uh, from this understanding uh, of the moon, and, uh, and, and implications also relate to the origins of the solar system. Well, Apollo 17 landed uh, in this picture uh, in a, uh, the edge of a basin called Serenitatis. That impact basin is about 740 kilometers in diameter. Uh, this picture I took uh, on the way of, of back home from the moon, a nearly full moon, and the right-hand third of that picture is the far side of the moon. Uh, the, uh, let's see, I do have, this uh, uh, is uh, uh, Chrysium, uh, and uh, Trinitatis, Tranquilitatis, and uh, Apollo 11 landed right in that area. So we were see, you see, we were considerably farther north uh, than Apollo 11, and in a very different, it turns out, very different geological terrain. The Valley of Taurus Retro is a, uh, and by the way, for those of you who presume that you have the same view I do, yeah, there's a little too much brown in that picture. It's quite a bit too much brown. It should look gray and bluish gray, it, it, rather than brown. So that's the best we can do with this particular. The uh, uh, the our landing is going to be right in there. Uh, the uh, uh, some things, some names that I'll be using off and on are the South Massif, which is the highest point in the valley. Uh, that point up there is, uh, is over 7,000 feet above the valley floor. North Massif, not quite as high. Uh, the slopes here are about 26 degree slopes, angle were opposed pretty much. And, uh, and here there was an avalanche that, of material that came off this South Massif of uh, regolith, uh, pulverized rock, uh, and probably lubricated by, uh, by hydrogen that was released in, in, by uh, uh, agitation as that uh, avalanche came up. There's a debate now uh, about how what triggered that avalanche. Initially, uh, for m many decades, we thought that there were Tycho secondaries here on top of the mountain. Uh, Tycho being a large crater to the southwest, uh, about 2,000 kilometers away. Uh, and uh, however, uh, uh, now we're wondering whether it might not have been caused by a fault. Uh, an earth, a moonquake, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, and then there's, uh, I'll probably say something about the sculptured hills, may not have time to go into that, but this area here uh, looks as if it is a very large uh, mass of uh, layered intrusive that has been ejected from the Embryo Basin and thrown some uh, 700 kilometers away, <laughs> if you can imagine that. Uh, we have a lot of data, I'm not going to get into it today, that suggests that, I think. Uh, that that's what uh, what that is. Uh, and of course, having worked on layered intrusives, I'm biased, uh, and uh, uh, by uh, both in Alaska and in Norway. <coughs> now, the, uh, the equipment that we use is shown in this picture, uh, and, and in geological terms, true geological terms, we had a camp. Use the microphone, please. Surely. Uh, we had a camp, which was the uh, the lunar module Challenger. Here, uh, we had a field vehicle, more or less a Jeep, but uh, it could be called anything. Uh, GM built it, so we're gonna have to call it something else, I guess. And the, uh, and of course you have your work clothes uh, that you have to use, and the tools, which are primarily uh, back here on the, uh, on the field vehicle. And uh, important for Apollo uh, field work was, of course, the support of the American taxpayer as symbolized by the flag of the United States. Uh, commanders always had a problem walking by the fenders of the rovers. Uh, they tended to break them off. Uh, these fenders were quite important because uh, in one sixth gravity, you, can, uh, you will get a uh, forward rooster tail as you drive because the dust uh, adheres just enough to these cleats that it will move forward. And the, the fender was to uh, break that trajectory. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in our first EDA, we did not have a replacement fender that you see here, and we got covered with dust as a result of that uh, exercise. Uh, but nevertheless, the uh, guys on the ground overnight uh, figured out how to uh, construct a replacement fender 
out of uh, unneeded photo maps uh, and some clamps right here on either side that we didn't need in the cabin uh, for, to hold lights. And this worked extremely well and uh, for the rest of our uh, excursions and the rest of our exploration. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about stratigraphic sampling. Uh, it turns out that uh, you can do that on the moon. This uh, uh, 6,000 foot high uh, North Massif slope here, it turns out to uh, uh, provide a very interesting way of doing stratigraphic sampling. Uh, and this is a picture of that slope. You're looking directly at the slope, and I hope that you can see some of those boulder tracks <coughs> that are coming down the mountain. There are a lot in this picture that uh, would not be visible on this projection. Uh, and uh, we'll see some more here in a moment. The uh, uh, two stations that we uh, visited at the base of the mountain, actually uh, Station 6 and Station 7, the large boulders, uh, both had tracks uh, uh, indicating where they came from up on the mountain. Uh, we, we saw the track for Boulder, uh, Boulder at Station 6, uh, actually did not see the track for the one at 7 until we had the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter photography. Uh, but it, it's there, and, uh, and the, the two boulders actually came with a, a true tr tr stratigraphic separation of about 500 meters. Uh, the, uh, this is a, a, a blow up of part of that, and you can see here, this is Station 6. That track is very clear. Not quite so clear, but I think you can make it out. Is the track going to the boulder at Station 7. So, and, and in, these, in these mountains, in the rim of these large basins where we were, uh, Serenitatis Basin, you do get a, a layered sequence of ejecta from various basins. And so having this uh, technique now uh, in the future is going to enable us to really start to produce a, a stratigraphic section of impact events uh, on the surface of the moon. We already can do a little bit of that, and I'll get into that here in a moment. Uh, there are about, I've been able to count about 10 tracks across that uh, inset, and, and one of them, and, and, and the, this boulder at Station 7, uh, may actually uh, represent uh, uh, ejecta, or have ejecta in it from the Embryon event, which is this big basin, 1,000 kilometer diameter basin off to the northwest. The, uh, this is that boulder. And just to give you a perspective, the lunar module is where that light spot is over there, right in there. Again, here is about uh, three and a half uh, miles away. The, uh, and uh, uh, that's yours truly there going out of sight around the boulder. You'll see the other face of the boulder here in a minute. Of course, our, our field vehicle parked on that 20, now at this point, a 20 degree slope. And you'll see footprints here uh, in the boulder track. This is the boulder track. And uh, those footprints, by the way, will last, oh, our estimates are vary, but uh, one to two million years. That's the rate at which the surface of the moon is gardened uh, disturbed by micrometeorites. Uh, although it's, it, I'm not going to get into this, but it hasn't always been that way. We've got evidence, strong evidence now that there were periods of extreme quiet about three and a half billion years ago when there weren't any micrometeorites of any significance. Figure that one out. Uh, now this is the Bullard Station 6 looking to head on to at a contact, which I've helped out with there, between a vesicular uh, impact melt or breccia uh, and a non-vesicular, largely non-vesicular, certainly not as, as, as much as that. These are all holes. These are great big smooth wall vesicles, these dark spots here. Uh, uh, some of them is uh, as big as 10 centimeters in diameter, remarkable. And so there was some kind of a volatile there. We don't know what it is. It left no trace in the walls of the vesicles. Probably hydrogen and maybe carbon monoxide would be my guess in a highly producing environment. Uh, but between the two uh, rock units here, oops, sorry. Well, this one, this one, there is a contact zone about a meter wide that uh, is also vesicular. So it gives you an idea that one, that this rock either intruded 
or certainly came in against this in some way uh, to create and had enough excess uh, or superheat in order to partially melt this contact zone. And so you, from these boulders, you can start to develop a pretty good geological story about uh, at least partially what had happened. Now, what about the ages of these uh, impact melts? Let me begin that by saying that this whole business uh, and lunar uh, dating using uh, the Argonne 4039 system is in a state of flux right now. We're, and it's in a state of flux to you because we now can get very, very good at it in, in looking at extremely small spots in these rocks. We couldn't do that during the first 35 years, most of the last uh, 35 years that we've had these rocks. Now we can. The dates you see here are the earlier dates. Uh, and they pro almost all of them probably incorporate some old uh, debris that's been incorporated in these breaches. And so that if I had to say they'd be biased uh, up in, our, our, in, in age uh, rather than uh, uh, being what they're finally going to turn out to be. Our colleagues at, uh, at ASU, at, at Washington U in St. Louis, and many other places now are, are developing laser techniques that are going to allow us to really precisely date these these uh, breaches. And, and what I'm showing you now is what we had up until that point in time. We're waiting for all of that results to come out, and I hope some of it will be reported at this conference in Houston. The, uh, but at any rate, it, within those limits, the intrusive impact melt breccia and the, uh, the rocket, uh, the intruded rock, have roughly the same ages. So they, Right now, you would uh, you would guess that they uh, were part of this, represent part of the same event, but uh, one being delayed in terms of its intrusion, uh, and and how that happened is another set of stories. Now, down at, over at Station Seven, we had essentially the same type of contact: the secular belt breccia against a uh, relatively non-vesicular rock. Uh, a little a norite class here that has a very old date, uh, uh, as, as do most of these so-called NT sweet uh, rocks that we find as class in these breaches. Uh, this, uh, uh, the dates here though are quite different. You get a date of the, uh, of the right hand unit about the same as what we had in the boulder at station six, but the left hand unit uh, is significantly younger. And, and the one, one of the dates I've seen, and the new dates I've seen uh, of the, uh, from the, the new techniques, laser techniques uh, for uh, argon dating, uh, pushes that date down even more. And, but again, my, right now I'm, I'm speculating that this is embryo impact melt pressure that has come from a long way, but still was molten enough uh, to give you a, a flow structure in the vesicles uh, as it cooled. Well, uh, some likely ages of the big basins on the moon, the focal harem, which is a controversial basin, not everybody agrees that it exists. Don Wilhelms and I may be the two holdouts on that uh, right now, although I think we'll win in the long run. Uh, a huge basin, 3,200 kilometers in diameter, continental scale. And any time I talk about these basins, you've got to be thinking these were forming on the Earth at the same time. Okay? Continental scale basins. On the Earth. It's awfully hard to find clues of what they are, but increasingly zircons are telling us that this probably was happening. We have zircons from uh, Jack Hills in Australia now that uh, are 4.4 billion years old. Well, that's getting awfully close to this. Where did those zircons come from? Well, probably a, a impact of that scale, and maybe even smaller, on Earth in a hydrous environment would create a melt sheet that would differentiate and would differentiate to the point of where you would actually crystallize zircons. We see that happening some, to some degree on the moon in some of these impact melts and almost certainly would happen in space here on Earth. So I think the zircons right now are one clue that this kind of thing was going on uh, here on Earth. Uh, South Pole Lakin is a 2,500 kilometer basin. You can't really see it in this 
image. It's, uh, it partially covers the South Pole, but it's mainly on the far side of the moon. Uh, but it, does, it appears from uh, just visual inspection of the, uh, of the amount of uh, impact erosion that's occurred on it to be younger than Procolarum, as well as we may have some dates from it. Uh, and these are huge events, you know, whatever is ejected from Procolarum is going to cover the whole moon. I mean, it's, it, and uh, probably lose some of the moon at the same time. Uh, another series of basins which are, uh, are, are non-masked Pucan basins, and I'll explain that more in a moment. Uh, Tranquilitatis, where Neil landed, and Facunditatis nearby. Then there's the Serenitatis, Christium, and Nectaris series on the near side. These are mass basins. That means that they're uh, gravitationally are large masses in the center of these basins, and they have not isostatically adjusted in three, uh, in, in almost four billion years. So the moon strengthened itself somehow between the formation of Tranquilitatis Facunditatis and these later basins. So there are two categories of basins, young basins that have mass cons, old basins that do not. South Pole Lincoln is an exception, but it is, it is such an exception that uh, it, it may be the one that pre proves the rule. That's it, something we can talk about later. Uh, and then Embryum, uh, uh, somewhat younger, uh, very large basin, it's about 1,000 kilometers in diameter, uh, but a young one. And uh, the one that you don't see here that is well known is Orientalic. It's over here uh, on that uh, part of the western rim of the moon. Uh, it is a, almost certainly a bit younger than Embryum, and uh, all the features of it indicate that. Well, the Mari basalts uh, are not a major unit on the moon and taken in, uh, in, at the surface of the moon. They may be major uh, at depth. Uh, but uh, they still are quite spectacular because they give us the features of the man and the moon. Uh, and, and we uh, uh, have uh, uh, a lot of age measurements on the Apollo 17 Mars basalts. Uh, they're very widespread. Uh, these are primarily rubidium strontium, but not all of them are. And, and uh, they, it seems there are no obvious differences between isotopic systems in these ages. Uh, and something like the long cooling, radioisotope migration, impact resets, and you name it, has, has spread these ages around. When you'd expect them to be uh, fairly uh, uh, uniform, they're not. And in fact, here's just a little plot, the age plot for the various sample locations. These are uh, the, the uh, uh, the various uh, sample locations. Uh, are indicated here, and when you look at that, uh, uh, average age is about 3.74, but tremendous spread. The orange volcanic ash that I mentioned, and we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, uh, is uh, uh, young, at least on iridium, iridium strontium age, is quite young relative to the other uh, basalts. It is basalt ash, but it's young, and a, and a significantly different composition. Uh, one of the craters we visited, it was the first station, we actually did geology, uh, significant geology. We collected a wreck sample, it's actually a sieve sample, uh, and we had a, a large number of basalt fragments in the, from the regolith in this. And when you uh, work, start working with those, you get some interesting evidence of fractional crystallization in that uh, basaltic lava. You'd expect it, and you can see evidence of it. Uh, there are two small uh, groups of samples outside of this 59 that I mentioned, just mentioned uh, that are uh, seem to be different, have a different, different differentiation trend. One is high uh, in TiO2, and the other is low in TiO2, which maybe is not surprising. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this just gives you an idea of what that differentiation trend might be. Uh, and, and in fact, I think what happens is that. Uh, uh, you immediately start crystallizing plagioclase, believe it or not, because your this TiO2 Al203 ratio increases, uh, and uh, which means that you're depriving the system of Al203. Well, where does the plagioclase go? Well, these are extraordinary fluid magmas. They're high density magmas. The plagioclase is probably floating, and there's some evidence in the regolith over this area that suggests that it has a higher concentration of plagioclase uh, in, in, the, in the regular debris than uh, you would otherwise expect. 
so uh, uh, the uh, uh, then other th things start to happen. The uh, you, you get a consistent trend of calcium. You practically just floating. Then titanium, and then the ammonite starts to crystallize, and you get a uh, that the titanium ratio starts to change. Uh, and uh, same there. And then uh, 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 probably uh, clinopyroxene begins to come out late in the uh, sequence. That's what is suggested here by this kind of, of information. Now, in terms of the pyroclastic, regional pyroclastic deposits, uh, this area, the region around the southern part of Serenitatis is, is rich in these deposits. Uh, here you see a picture that we took from orbit uh, showing a, a boundary between pyroclastics here and just uh, clear maria surface regolith here. And, and you see that there is an association with these Graben systems, uh, which is not surprising uh, to have a source for the pyroclastics. What is very hard to find is an actual vent. Now, there are a few places where you can argue their vents and stuff, but it, these are these are apparently very pervasive eruptions of, of pyroclastics of ash. The uh, uh, one uh, uh, kidney-shaped crater that I observed from orbit several times is right here, and even in this picture, you may be able to see some of the uh, red ash that I was able to see in nice layers with the binoculars, with a monocular, nice layers. In that uh, wall of that crater. This probably was a vent. It's rimless, uh, and then it collapsed after it erupted. But Shorty Crater gave us a chance to uh, look at some of this. Shorty was uh, about an 80 uh, meter diameter impact crater, no question about that. Uh, Station 4, uh, where we found the orange soil, was located there. There was a black, there is a black ash layer right there. You'll see again in a moment. Uh, now these black uh, stripes down here are actually tracks, uh, CERN and Wilbur to take a panorama, and those are uh, tracks in black ash that got stirred up and uh, show much better than normal tracks would uh, around the, uh, these kind of craters. The black ash layer that I mentioned is there, uh, and uh, there's a light gray regolith underneath. Uh, uh, we see it, and uh, you'll see it again in a moment, this may be another location for it. Uh, the, in the bottom of the crater, or almost certainly, is a, uh, a, a subfloor basalt. That's just a term that they were using uh, to talk about the basalts. Uh, and, but it was a type C. There's three types of basalts recognized in Apollo 17, A, B, and C. A and B are probably uh, differentiation transition uh, basalts. But type C is, is different. There's a barium depletion in type C, very striking. And, and that's what you see most of here at this crater, including the, uh, the orange soil, uh, the orange ash, which you see there, you see some more along here, and there's some down here. Uh, and a very, uh, 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 apparently, a concentration of black ash over here in the orange. And this is the uh, uh, close up of that orange soil air, uh, deposit again. Uh, dug a trench very quickly. We only had 30 minutes to sample this. We discovered it. The walk back constraints gave us 30 minutes. And so we just, I just ignored the ground, frankly, and went to work, dug a trench, got the samples. And then a couple I would have liked to have gotten, but we just didn't have the time. So the one sample I, I missed was one right here. This was yellowish right next to this contact of, of light gray regolith. But I did get a sample of the light gray regolith here and there, and, uh, and, and that plus a number of other things start to give you an idea of what the strategic, the uh, <coughs> pre-shorty impact strategic might have been. You had the uh, type A uh, basalt at the bottom. Uh, the uh, regolith would have developed on that from impacts. A type C basalt. Uh, above that, uh, and uh, and then regolith on that type C to put the salt, uh, black fire classic ash, uh, and then uh, the orange ash, uh, for one reason or another, on top of that. We'll talk about that later. And uh, and and then a uh, something had to protect the orange ash, otherwise it would have been incorporated into the regolith. So soon after it was erupted, it was covered by a volcanic by a flow. But we've seen that before, Sunset Crater. I mean, uh, uh, not well, Sunset is a good one, uh, but also SP Crater up in Flagstaff. 
<coughs> your flag staff. There, that's something you might expect to happen. Once the volatiles have gone, uh, then you can uh, see that kind of thing happen. Uh, so there was a protective flow, and it looks like that we sampled that regular from that flow with those two samples that I mentioned from here and from there. And uh, over the, all of this was this avalanche that I mentioned earlier. That covered Shorty Crater, Shorty penetrated it, and uh, that's what made it interesting because it looked so obviously dark on top of that light covered avalanche. And this is the, uh, this is what I think, uh, I think you actually have a, uh, a slightly recumbent uh, overturn, or overturn, uh, fold in the uh, fire classics and in the uh, covering uh, light gray regular. Uh, and there's a number of different pieces of evidence that tend to support this, this kind of model where the impact just compressed this, uh, these flows into this kind of machine. And we were fortunate enough to stumble on it. That's, that's what's fun about geology. You never know what you're going to stumble on. Uh, now, uh, the last thing I'd like to get into a little bit is this, uh, this thrust faulting we talked about a little bit at the table. Uh, is uh, There's a fault, uh, sometimes called a wrinkle ridge, but it's actually a, pretty clearly a thrust fault going across the valley here. They're, they're common all across the moon. Uh, and, and they're probably, some of them are relatively young as the moon is contracting thermally. Uh, it, uh, these kind of uh, uh, faults may be forming. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, and what makes this one uh, particularly interesting is that here's, here's your Jefferson Lincoln scar uh, fault. Uh, and, and, and when you look at the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, Mini RF, the radar, uh, you, you pick up a uh, subsidiary fault. Never saw it except in the radar. And then uh, you can start to think about where that uh, uh, may go. You, and you start to convince yourself, yeah, uh, you can see a, a surface expression of some kind. But the radar is pretty persuasive. Uh, and, and that immediately brings up the uh, question to some of us. You see this moat here, the South Massif? That was puzzling everybody. What caused that moat? Uh, why is it separated? Well, maybe the fault separated. The thrust fault, it's in the right direction. Uh, it, it, that may be the source of that moat. It, the moat is deep enough so the talus has not filled it. One other alternative was that it's forming gradually over time and it's just fast enough to stay ahead of the talus. Uh, it's, form, it's, it's deforming isostatically, but uh, this is starting to become a more attractive uh, uh, solution to that. Now, another thing about this uh, fault is that uh, what I call shaken, not stirred terrain. It, uh, if it was a sudden uh, fault, uh, I think you can see this. This is not a good image to convince you, uh, but that uh, you do have areas that appear to have been shaken. And as we crossed it in our rover, I made a comment that everything looked mantled. Well, that's sort of what you would expect a shaken terrain to look like, that the small craters have been destroyed. And there's more work to be done here in, 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 in water. I'm sorry. That uh, there, There's more work to be done here in trying to determine whether this uh, actually did happen. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it is, uh, uh, it is an, an area, a new area of investigation, and whether or not uh, this falling could have triggered that uh, avalanche. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting close to uh, the end, and uh, one thing I want, did want to point out in reference to uh, Bob's comments is that uh, as you uh, get more and more of a feeling for what this, this debris layer is like on the moon, uh, it becomes more and more of an interest economically, and that is because that is where the uh, volatile resources, the solar wind volatile resources, are concentrated. Uh, hydrogen is uh, is probably the most abundant, maybe 100 to 200 parts per million uh, in that. Uh, uh, but also there is uh, 20, uh, 10 to 20 parts per billion helium three. Helium three is a an ideal fuel for fusion power production. We just don't have any here on Earth. If we did, almost certainly that's where fusion power would be headed today. 
the moon is a, a tremendous uh, reservoir of this solar wind derived uh, helium-3 and uh, in the, the book that some of you have uh, sort of outlines the economic geology and the and the business side of, of actually maybe uh, someday getting that uh, fusion fuel back. The reason it's ideal is it, it produces no residual radioactivity. When it fuses itself, no neutrons are produced and so the, the reactor never becomes radioactive. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and it also produces protons which you convert directly to electricity. So it's a very nice story, except the resources on the moon. So with that, uh, if we have time, I'll take some questions after we depart the moon. Oh, I have to remind myself here. We did have an alternative way to leave the moon. We did have an alternative way to leave the moon. We had, if needed, everything else failed, and there were many different ways to get those engines started. We had jumper cables. <laughs> and uh, the only thing you had to do, one guy had to go out, and you had to depressurize in your suit, uh, put on uh, a, uh, a, uh, uh, the emergency oxygen supply would give you about uh, uh, 30 or 40 or 50 minutes of, of breathing oxygen. Go out and attach the cables to a battery in the descent stage. Take it up uh, in the cabin. And then when you're ready to go, you just clip those alligator clips onto two circuit breakers. And the engines would, ignite, would be forced to ignite. So, there was not much concern about staying on the moon. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Any questions? Or do you have time? Yep. Yes, sir. You said you, the, the thrust faults indicate that the moon is shrinking? Yeah, and you would expect, you know, thermally it is losing, gradually cooling down. Okay, do you think that analog would apply to this plant? Not right now, no. I think we're still generating, uh, we're much bigger, we're generating a lot of radioisotopic heat. So you think we're expanding on this plant? Uh, I don't know, we're probably pretty much constant now. It's, it's probably reached a stable, four and a half billion years is probably enough to stabilize it, but I'm going to leave that to people like Jim Hayes and stuff. To, decide whether we've reached to the linear or, or started down down the curve. There's still an, an awful lot of uh, convective heat being moved around in the mantle of the curve. Yes, sir. I'm sure you've got a million questions, big questions on, you know, how is how is it to walk on the moon? How is it to be weightless? I'm thinking of something that you saw that was subtle, that really impressed you when you went to the moon? Nothing's very subtle about being on the moon. Let me think about that. Well, I'm thinking but, like as a geologist, sometimes you hit a rock and you break it open and there's just a perfect little quartz crystal or something that, and when you see it, you go, wow. Well, one of the things that I very quickly realized, and it is subtle, that I could do is I could use these micrometeor impacts and the little tiny thing, we call them zap pits, mm -hmm. on the rock to determine what the mineralogy of the rock was, more or less, general mineralogy. If, they, if, the, uh, if, if the glass in that zap pit was a milky white, it was almost all plagioclase. As it got greener and blacker, then it got increasing amounts of naked minerals. And that's a pretty subtle thing, but I said that you picked that. For some reason, I had not thought about that before I got to the surface of the moon. And as soon as I started looking, getting my faceplate right down on a rock, I realized what you could do with it. And, and so it, it, enabled, it helped me uh, to, uh, to at least make a, a, an initial assessment of whether I was dealing with a basalt or a impact pressure. The impact brushes have much more plagioclase in them than the basalts. Yes, sir. Obviously, a hand lens doesn't help much while you're in your suit. But did you have uh, things like that available so that between EVAs you could uh, examine these more carefully? Yes, we had a hand lens available in the cabin, and I used it to to uh, to correct my observations. I'd overestimated the amount of plagioclase in these basalts in the first EVA. And I, but I had samples and I could look at it and say, yeah, I, 
I was, I was a little bit high, by about 50 percent. They weren't quite as pledge rich as I thought. And uh, uh, they are pledge rich, but they're not uh, as, as much. So we did have, I did have a hand lens <laughs> that I could use uh, between excursions. But uh, it, it wouldn't work very well uh, during the excursion. As a matter of fact, uh, every, every, I think every, all 12 of the astronauts have been to the moon when they picked up a rock and tried to blow the dust off. <laughs> <laughs> I did, <laughs> and, I, and I know Cernan did, and I inspired. Well, I would guess everybody, because when, when we take them out on our field trips, ge their geology instructions are breaking a rock and they're blowing the dust off, <laughs> so it becomes a habit. Even <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did you see any evidence for volatile water gassing? Well, I, the, the, the pyroclastic ash is evidence of volatile outgassing, and I didn't mention, but when you analyze the ash, there are two major things. They are coated in uh, volatiles, volatile elements uh, from the halogens uh, and zinc and tellurium, things like that. Lead, they're coated with that, each bead is, at uh, factors of 100 to 10 more than the basalts, than you find in the basalts. So there were, that's the first evidence we had, and it was hard to get people to, to recognize that for a long time, but Chuck Meyer was a big help in that. Um, he, uh, uh, but the, uh, that's the son of the, the Chuck Meyer from Butte days. Uh, the, uh, uh, but now, in the last, uh, now four years, a uh, team uh, led by, uh, <coughs> Uh, Brown Group uh, have actually gone inside the these beads, found little tiny phenocrysts of olivine, and found water in the olivine. Mm -hmm. Water inclusion, so indigenous water. So we're we're, we're not only now are uh, know that uh, what some of us had always suspected that there are volatile reservoirs, including water deep within the moon, that are feeding these pyroclastics. Uh, but that uh, it is another source, potential source, for the water that you see at the poles now as uh, water ice. And, uh, and, and comets are in one, but, but the redistribution of that, of that uh, uh, pyroclastic volatile uh, component, which part of which was water, is another one. So uh, it's, uh, it doesn't change the value of the ice at the poles, uh, but it is uh, an explanation of uh, another problem possible explanation of why it's there. Yes, Jimmy. Yeah, you described uh, grobbins, thrust faults, and angles of repose. And here on Earth, when we, as you know, when we compress sand, we create 30 degree dipping thrusts. And, and if we extend sand, we get 60 degree dipping normal faults. But I think it relates to the angle of repose, the angle of internal friction. Uh, some students came to me from U of A who were in the zero gravity NASA program. They asked what kind of experiment could be run. And we decided to run sandbox experiment, which is pretty messy up there in zero gravity. <laughs> but it strikes me that it would be interesting if the thrust dip a little steeper on the moon and the normal faults dip a little more shallowly because the angle of repose is not 31, but it's 26. So when you go back up there next time, take your compass. <laughs> sounds, sounds like a great idea. There are some grovins in the avalanche. I took those slides out. And the avalanche is debris. It's uh, 10 to 15 to 20 meters thick. And, uh, and there are some, some grovins that develop. And I don't know whether they developed at the end of the flow stage, yeah. like pull apart or, or what, but there are some. So the, those. And we might have sufficient re resolution now in the LRO pictures to, to, to think about that, yeah, to that possibility. Uh, I had not thought of it, it was a great idea. And uh, the, uh, 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 you might have some students get a hold of Mark Robinson and see if they can uh, get the pictures of the, the little, one place I know where those are is in the, in the avalanche, near the head of the avalanche, not the toe. But the yes. Could you describe the smell of the lunar soil? It's, I've heard it was like... All, all the astronauts thought the, the soil, when they opened the, 
closed up the cabinet and repressurized. In the first few minutes, they all said it smells like spent gunpowder. And it does. Why? I think it's primarily because it's still uh, highly activated. It has not, the surfaces of these particles uh, have nothing to adhere to them but other particles when they're on the moon. It's 10 to the minus 12 Thor, Tor uh, vacuum out there. And when you bring them in, it takes them a while to absorb oxygen and water that, and CO2 that's in the cabin atmosphere. And uh, so you still can smell that highly activated carbon-like material. That would be my, my, uh, my guess. Jim? What do you think about current prospects of getting uh, humans beyond lower Earth orbit? What do I think about current prospects of getting the humans uh, beyond Earth orbit? Uh, probably overall pretty good. Uh, now whether they're going to be Americans or not is another question. And we'll just have to wait and see whether uh, that kind of an issue is, it becomes uh, geopolitical significance enough to, uh, to reformulate a, uh, a program. Now there's been a lot of talk and, uh, uh, about uh, Mars being the next great objective, and I agree with that. But I think the fastest way to get there is to go by way of the moon. And I got a long list of 15 or 20 items that you need to know, and you certainly would like to know, and probably need to know before you're going to be able to accomplish a Mars mission. And the moon allows you to, to check those off. Uh, just take one thing. Uh, the, the crews that land on Mars are going to be landing autonomously. There may be a lot of uh, automatic control and stuff like that, but they're not going to have any help. And no, nobody's going to be looking over their shoulder because this, the communication gap is just too long. And, uh, and so that, that you can work out in, in, on the moon. You don't have to go to Mars with that. It's only three days away up there. Plus, uh, radiation protection is going to be very important for the long trip, even if you get fusion rockets to accelerate it. Uh, and the moon is a source of water. Uh, you can heat up the regolith anywhere on the moon and produce water. And so it's a it's an available source of water. You don't have to lift it off the Earth, and you can fill your shells around your spacecraft with water, and that protects you against a whole bunch of radiation. And I think will be very important. And, and the list is very very long of why a lunar settlement program, not to mention helium three being produced, uh, is I think your fastest way to get to water. Uh, you mentioned there's water in the Olivine number one. How much water? And number two, are there any other things in those elements like hydrocarbons or carbon or what? Yeah, the question is, is there anything else in the uh, olivine phenocris in the glass besides water? Uh, that I'm not sure, but I, I don't remember seeing it reported, anything besides water. And some of these other elements that I mentioned that are on the coatings, they're there too. Like carbon, is it carbon on the coatings? Uh, yes, there is, yeah. Uh, uh, there is carbon, there's sodium, uh, fluorine, chlorine, as I said, chlorium. The lead is primitive, by the way. It's primitive lead that's coming out. So that suggests that you're actually tapping a, a, a reservoir uh, in the moon that's below the, uh, the part of the moon that melted as a magma ocean, for those of you who are in, into this kind of thing. <laughs> the outer 500 kilometers of the moon is thought to have been mo totally molten at one time by most people. Uh, and you would not expect to see primitive lead that's one there. So you, you may be getting all those volatiles from deeper within the moon in a protocore, uh, pro uh, chondritic protocore. Uh, yes, does. Is there any horn blend up there? Any horn blend? Uh, boy, did somebody finally report a little piece of horn blend in one of the rocks? I'm not sure. But they have, uh, they have appetites which appear to have some of the water, uh, both water and uh, halogen, I think, uh, fluorine. I think they're fluoroamatites, but with, with some water. That's another recent uh, uh, discovery. The, the technology is, is moving so that you can see some of these things. We never could see 40 years ago. Didn't know they were there. And so you have, to, you have to give the people working 40 years ago a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, because they didn't have the, the technology we have today. Uh, they're, uh, uh, don't, I'm not aware of any actual hydrous minerals that have been reported, but I could be corrected on that. Sometimes I miss a paper here and there. Yes? 
Well, there are Feldstein rocks in, on the moon in the sense that they're anorthosites. They're, but they're very, uh, very calcic uh, uh, Most the, the crust of the moon is thought to have been formed by uh, the flotation of, of plagioclase, uh, calcic plagioclase, on the surface of this magma ocean. And, uh, and that, uh, uh, that actually is referred to as a, uh, as a uh, feral anorthosite because there's a little bit of iron that has, has uh, iron minerals that are associated with that. But it's mostly appears to be uh, uh, concentrated uh, anorth anorthite. Uh, and when you look at the far side of the moon, look at some of the orbital chemical analyses of the far side of the moon, there are large areas that appear to be very, very high in anorthite. And strangely enough, that is also areas that are highest in uh, sensed uh, hydrogen from orbit. Now, why do you think that's the case? <laughs> why would why would Felspar, if Bob Garros was here, he would know. Uh, why would Felspar uh, pick up hydrogen preferentially to other minerals? Have you ever heard of H. Felspar? As a, as an intermediate product in weather, I think that's what you have on the moon. Solar wind hydrogen that's uh, replaced sodium uh, in these feldspars. And in fact, sodium is one of the ma major components of the transient atmosphere around the moon. So it starts to make a little bit of sense. Way back there. Okay, the question is, uh, should we continue to use test pilots and military trained pilots uh, as part of the astronaut corps? I think you have to, uh, because they're, you, you need operational types of people. And, uh, and scientists take a while to train in that area, just like pilots take a while to train in the science area. So the, the best mix of crews is going to be one that uh, has a mix of talents and experience, primarily experience. Uh, got the experience you probably got the talent uh, and uh, and I think we showed that in Apollo and in Skylab that those and in shuttle that those mixes work very very well uh, and now uh, the uh, it doesn't hurt at all for the scientists and I've always been an advocate of this it doesn't hurt at all I think for scientists to become pilots I think they should because you learn an awful lot about it how to work in a world where your confidence has to be put into a machine that's a, that's a psychological learning as well as a technical learning that uh, pilot training can give you. And uh, I think it's been a mistake that NASA has not continued to, to vigorously train their scientists as pilots. So they're, they're better now than they were, but they're, they're still, it ought to be more emphasis there. The, uh, uh, it makes it tougher on training on scientists, but it's an important uh, skill, I think, to have. And it also helps to integrate you into the total community. It's a, for us in Apollo, it was a joint skill that we all had, and that meant a lot in your ability to communicate with each other. You weren't just sitting off here as a nerd waiting to fly on a spacecraft. That's good. Yes, sir. How much of the um, there were terms about Practically all of the samples have been examined, the lunar samples have been examined uh, to uh, some degree. Uh, there are catalogs uh, that tell you what kind of sample it is, what the rock type is. There, there was in the early days a tremendous amount of work done to characterize almost every sample so that investigators could look at those catalogs and say, do I want to work on this sample or do I want to work on that sample? Now, in terms of, of a detailed mineralogical examination, uh, ge uh, geochemical examination, age dating, so then that number shrinks quite a bit. And particularly now that we're finding that maybe all, most of our age dates aren't very good, uh, at least the argon uh, system is not good. Uh, that uh, you know that opens up a whole new realm of investigation for people 
uh, what I've shown, what I showed you there on those ages, I hope I've made it clear, are based on the old dates. They're not based on the new ones. And there aren't very many new ones to look at yet. But there, fortunately, are teams uh, gearing up to do this new laser uh, spot uh, uh, analysis for, uh, for Argonne. The uh, uh, one, uh, one other deficiency that I think we've had, and we all are responsible for it, is that we geared up to work on very, very small samples. Uh, 50 years ago, NASA was funding uh, labs like Jerry Wasserberg's and others to, to learn how to do mass spectrometry on extremely small amounts of material because we didn't know how much we were going to get back. And it might not have been very much. And they got very good at it. In fact, there are all sorts of consequences of that revolution in, my, in, uh, in uh, mass spectrometry. You know, we get scared by all sorts of elements now that are in our water because we can, we can measure them. Whether they're really a problem or not is another issue. But nevertheless, uh, that is, and, and now we're going into a, a whole new era of being able to get these kinds of analyses where you don't have to do tr traditional mass spectrometry. Uh, so it, uh, uh, it, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's a gift that keeps on giving. It's going to, as your technology advances, as your ideas advance, these samples are going to get increasingly valuable, I think, too. But particularly if you're trying to understand the early history of the Earth. The moon is the Hadean on Earth. That's its story. And all we have right now to tie them together is are the big basins on the moon, and the fact, the almost certain fact that the moon was in orbit around the Earth, or at least nearby in the solar system during that period of time. And, and, that, uh, uh, and that we have these zircons that are giving us ages that you have to explain by some process uh, happening on a very early Earth, 4.4 billion years. So, uh, uh, like I said, gift that keeps on giving. It's, uh, for the, at least for the lunar geologists, it continues to be exciting and has been for over 40 years now, 45 years. Um, Bob, I think we need up. to uh, allow the uh, staff to uh, clear the tables, but I'm sure that Senator Schmidt will be happy to hang around for a bit and chat. Also, uh, I just got handed a note.